Eleonora. Thanks for the postcard from your recent vacation. I can still see the image in my mind. That man like a Roman head in a frying pan. I saw Rick a few months ago. It was just after I'd lost my job taking care of Mr. Valentine, an old invalid. I moved here for the job, but his wife was afraid if he was too happy, he might live longer. So she fired me. She wanted his money to buy racehorses and move to Las Vegas. So then I figured I was just meant to live on this island I stayed on. I'm working now at the local pub for this ancient but beautiful Hawaiian woman named Auntie Jo, who's a legend across the South Pacific. The other night I ran out of gas on my way home from work. This tourist couple I'd seen in the bar earlier in the evening stopped and gave me a lift home. I let them camp out on the lawn. It was too late for them to drive onto the park. When I got up in the morning, they were gone. The woman reminded me of someone. I can't place her. It was odd. I want to tell you about finding my cottage by the ocean. I heard about it from a friend, called the owner in Honolulu, but she sounded doubtful about renting it to me. As it turned out, I planned to go over to Honolulu that weekend, so I suggested that I meet with her and she could interview me and make a decision. Her name was Julie. Before, she, before I left, I was driving with a friend who stopped by a papaya farm near to pick up some papayas and also some large halicone. When I got ready to leave for the airport at the last minute, I decided to take along the heliconias as a gift of our island flowers. I was to meet Julie at 1 p.m. I arrived early and sat down to wait and noticed a young-looking gray-haired woman reading a newspaper. She commented on the flowers and I said they were for a friend I was meeting. After about 10 minutes, we looked at each other and realized who we were, so I said, these flowers are for you. She said, how, where did you get them? And I started to say, Boy Lahaina's farm. And she interrupted me to say, Boy Lahaina was her brother. So after we had the interview, I was pretty sure the other applicants for the rental cottage couldn't top my act. Needless to say, I was right because she rented it to me. I guess this letter is getting long enough. I didn't mean to go on so, but since we don't get together often, I might as well give you a good idea of my life over here in the boondocks. Maybe it will seem exotic and be dull. It's both. It never seems to get much better, only different. Hope all is well with you and that someday I'll see you over here. Love, Celine. Hi, Celine. Kaipo here. Look, everything's set for the 11th. About five of us are going to hide in the sand dunes during the launch. I've contacted the press so they know that some of us are going to be hiding in the restricted area during the blast off. There's a lot of public attention on this, but I think that we can really pull this off. We're going to stop that launch. Celine, it's Pete. I'm worried about the trials. Do we need separate attorneys, or are we all going to go into the arraignment as John does? What do you want us to call me? It's Jeannie. I've talked to Senator Gunshot and Representative Whalehead. The crucial hearing in Congress will be starting tomorrow. Call me as soon as you get in. This is Lonnie calling. Hey, Celine, things don't look so good with this anti-missile launch rally. Those guys at the missile base are really pissed off. If we shut down that base, they're going to be out their jobs. Hey, you don't think they'd accidentally shoot? Celine, I think our phones are bugged. I mean, I swear somebody was following me today. He told me what a guy in a suit is doing to rent a car, following me around while I deliver papayas. I don't like it. You know what somebody said about the FBI? First they kill your dog. Dear Stryker, hey, it was good to hear from you. 
I hope things work out for you with that beer distributorship. I've been here now for almost a year. I'm very attached to my home, albeit it is in a tsunami zone, which means that when an earthquake happens in Alaska, a giant 40-foot wave works its way across the Pacific to this little bay and valley and surges in and surges out with even greater force and destruction and then does that a few more times. And then the fortunate that have either reached higher ground somehow or managed to climb one of the three very tall Norfolk pines and stand on tiptoe from there. Nowadays I hear there's a warning siren. In the old days before written word, which is as early as the beginning of this century, nobody knew anything about tsunamis because there hadn't been one for a while. So one day when the old Chinese grandfather and his Hawaiian wife looked out from the front porch one morning and saw the sea had drastically receded and that the fish were just laying there in the shallows. Then, of course, they saw the huge wave coming in and lost their homes and animals and most of the little village here and almost lost grandmother herself. Then there was another one in 1947, and after that the government offered the family some land up on the ridge, and so they built up there so they wouldn't have to go through another tsunami again. So now they keep this cottage here on the side of the old homestead. There is an old graveyard up on the hill and many old graves, but two of the most interesting are two old Chinese gravestones which instead of facing out to sea face to the valley and the ohana or family below to keep an eye on things. We had a really bad storm a few months ago. People that live around here still remember and talk about it. We've been having a lot of rain and the weather had been socked in with some kind of gray front or some for some time and one night the storm came. I had tied a big blue tarp on my car because there had been so much rain that the interior had flooded. Well, I woke up about one or hear the wind flapping the bejesus out of the tarp, so I got up and went out to retie it before it started to rain again. Then the wind really kicked up and was so strong it was scary. My bed was beneath a plate glass window and I refused to sleep in it. The rain was blowing straight into the plate glass window and I thought it might blow in. The next day, you wouldn't have believed how many trees were down. It blew all the needles off the pines between here and the bay. Anyway, all of a sudden I heard this big noise like a zapping mm, sound, like a spaceship hitting an electrical field. I knew that the electrical transformer just below my front door had blasted. What a, what a night. Pitch black and now no lights. The wind, uh, the wind whining and lashing and clawing and tearing. When it finally died down, the repairman came out and fixed the line several hours later, but what a night. I ate much and was glad when daylight came. Last weekend scared the french fries out of me too. I actually got thrown in jail from being in a protest rally. I'd gone into Lahui to see about my car insurance, which had expired, and saw a group gathered on the county building steps with signs and yelling. The government launches these old dangerous missiles from the base out on the west side of the island. Never mind fish, whales, dolphins, people all over the Pacific, especially the atoll the missiles are targeted near. Ever since the jail incident, everybody's asking me what to do about this and that, like I'm a big environmental activist leader all of a sudden. The main problem with all the attention is that most of the time I feel like somebody's watching me. Supposedly this island is haunted with spirits and ghosts of every sort. I'm told this is the jumping off place for souls on the way to the next world, the interdimensional Grand Central Station. One time fallen in love with this sailor from Holland who'd spent his life traveling the shark-infested straits between worlds living on ships, raging in distant ports. I woke up one night because I heard a radio playing. Strangest thing, couldn't make out the tune or the lyrics, but it sounded like a radio buffeted on the wind and droned down by the surf pounding on the reef. It kept me awake all night. Somebody told me it was a spirit and not to go outside for any reason. The next night again, sounded like a woman. 
I looked all around the room and couldn't find where it was coming from, the ceiling, the valley, or behind the house. At last, I fell back asleep. The next day, I saw the sailor, and he looked awful, dark circles under his eyes. His mood was black. He told me about his life, and it seemed he'd fallen in love with a woman in Tahiti. He'd never gotten over the obsession in spite of how much rum he drank. After that, I never saw him again, and the radio voice went with him. Well, I'll be seeing you. Love, Celine. Dear Anna, how is life in the city? I miss you. You're on my mind lately. What I'm going through now started when I was there and my life got so crazy and I couldn't handle it anymore. It must have been that June that it started to percolate to the surface. A tap of fears, then this depression like a weapon against any hope. Now the dreams are coming so strong, Anna. I can't even get out of bed. The dreams are vampires. Last night I felt the presence. Okay, so now it's now I'm getting closer. Now I recognize that there is another person. A presence, a shadow, a shade, another entity that's been there all along. A mystery to me. Maybe she's the one who knew the secret all along. Now it's like I conjure her up like voodoo, trying to tap into myself and draw her out. I go down and look at the bay and see the wind lashing with the water blowing on my face. Several weeks ago, I was down at the bay and feeling bad that day. So I found a small rock that was very round and chalked on it with some pastels. Orangey red, purple, some black scratches, and maybe a little light green. Then I washed it, but the chalk didn't come off very much, just enough to give it a strange and rugged nut-like appeal. I decided that it would represent some pain of mine. A small round rock like a egg to symbolize some old pain and then leave it there among the trees and needles and other drifted rubble and sea debris. So I placed the orangey red part face up because that was probably the anger part and then I left it there to be washed over by high tides and rains so that it could take on a life of its own and be a stone out of feelings there in the bay out of me. When I walked down there this evening, the stone was gone. Someone had taken it. But the feather was there in the indentation I had made for the rock in the sand, like a grave. Love, Selene. <laughs>